hear your favorite NFL legends sharing their stories and insights every week right here on Thursday Night Tailgate with Chris Mascaro and Bob Lazari. Take it away, guys. Right now, it's locked. There's no way out. And now back in making his ninth appearance with us on the Kyvan Foods guest line is Chad Brown. Let me remind you about Chad's background. He's from Pasadena, California, played his college ball at Colorado, where he was a four-year starter, an all-Big Eight selection in his junior and senior seasons, and a second-team All-American his senior year. Chad's going to be inducted into Colorado's Athletic Hall of Fame on November the 9th. Kudos to Chad. He was a second-round draft pick in 1993 by the Pittsburgh Steelers, played linebacker in the NFL for an amazing 15 years, from 1993 to 2007, for the Steelers, Seahawks, and Patriots. In all, he played in 189 games, had 79 sacks, forced 17 fumbles, recovered 15, had six interceptions, and he scored three touchdowns. He won the Joe Green Performance Award while with the Steelers in 1993. He was named to the Seattle Seahawks 35th anniversary team. And we are honored he is back with us tonight here on Thursday Night Tailgate. Hey, Chad, Chris, and Bob, thanks for coming back on the show. Hi, Chad. Uh, always happy to be on with you guys. So, Chad, congratulations on the Colorado Athletic Hall of Fame induction coming up. Has to be a very exciting night for you coming. It is. It is. You know, when you uh, are given that type of honor, obviously it's a reflective type of moment, and you can't help but look back at all the uh, people who helped you get there. You know, no one gets into any Hall of Fame by themselves. Um, so while it is a celebration for me to be in the Hall of Fame, you know, I really want to make it a celebration of those people who helped me get there, who inspired me, who, you know, picked me up when I was weak, who, uh, you know, drove me, all those types of things to, uh, you know, give back to those folks and let them know how important they were to the, you know, little bit of success that I uh, had. So, to that end, who who are some of the people that you know you know you'd like to thank and that really you know sort of helped your career along, whether it was you know when you were a kid or through your time in college or in the NFL. You know, I've just been one of those guys who was incredibly lucky with you know all my coaches my entire life. Uh, you know, to uh, go to the University of Colorado when Bill McCartney was there. Obviously, you know, folks have probably seen the Thirty for Thirty, the Gospel According to Mac to be around such a, a strong guy, such a forceful guy. Uh, when I showed up at the University of Colorado, the last thing I wanted was another dad. I already had a dad in my life. Turns out that was exactly what I needed. So, you know, to work backwards, I would start with Bill McCartney, go back to, you know, my, my high school coach, Jim Brownfield. Uh, you know, he is also in the NA Hall of Fame. He's in the California Coaches Hall of Fame was an incredible coach in all different sports uh, and really inspired a tradition at the, at uh, John Muir high school. Uh, so, you know, with lots of scholarship athletes under his tutelage, not just in football, but in men's track and also in women's track. Uh, my pop Warner coaches, my mother and father, uh, heck, you know, my, my wife, you know, feeding me good food, giving me a soft home to come to. So the list is quite long. You know, you, you said the uh, Call of Fame induction ceremony is November 9th, so I still have some time to, to write out the speech and, and really list everybody down, but those are the names that come off the top of my head. And, Chad, I want to stick with, you know, your alma mater, Colorado, and your Buffaloes are 3-1 and one so far this season. Tough loss last week to Washington, but how do you feel about their chances this season in the Pac-12 South? It's going to be tough. It's going to be a tough year. And obviously, USC is looking good. They've got a great quarterback. Uh, they got UCLA this weekend out there in California. They've also got a great quarterback. So uh, the, the thought that they could sneak up on people as they did last year, that's done. People know who the buffs are. I think they believe them to be for real, and they're going to get people's best games now. Uh, the difference between them and Washington, between them and Oklahoma State in the bowl game, was clear last year. Uh, and now Washington showed them again, you know, that there is a difference. You guys are playing pretty good ball, Colorado Buffaloes, but Washington is truly a top five college football team. Uh, Pac-12, uh, Offensive Player of the Year at quarterback, a all-time returner with Pettis. They play a tremendous uh, style of defense. They are stacked from top to bottom. So for the Buffs to find themselves back in the Pac-12 championship with a 
with what would be a likely rematch against Washington from last year's Pac-12 championship game. The Buffs have a ways to go. They look pretty good in the non-conference schedule, but starting off the conference schedule with Washington definitely showed it's going to be a tough hill to climb for the Colorado Buffaloes. Five questions for Chad. Great to speak with you as usual, Chad. And getting back to a little bit about the people that were responsible for your success, <clears throat> as far as players when you came into the league, that was an incredible collection of defensive players in Pittsburgh, Greg Lloyd, Kirkland, and Woodson, and we can go on and on, Kevin Green. Uh, if you had to pick anyone, uh, Chad, as far as how uh, who really introduced you how to be a pro as opposed to maybe taking you under the wing? Who did you learn most about being a pro player? Well, this year uh, I had a chance to do my third coaching internship in the NFL. Uh, I've done it the last three seasons during training camp. Two years ago, Seattle Seahawks. Last year, Tennessee Titans. This year I was with the New York Jets, and I wanted to do it with the Jets not because of the Jets, but because I could work with Kevin Green again. Obviously, Kevin and I were teammates with the Pittsburgh Steelers teams. And uh, of the guys, being with Rod Woodson, being with Greg Lloyd, being with Carnell Lake, uh, being with some of my University of Colorado teammates, Deion Figures, Joel Steed, I would say Kevin was the guy who I most modeled my game after, whose approach to the game, whose level of professionalism, uh, really struck me the most. Obviously, we were sharing a meeting room as linebackers together, so I was working closely with them. So it was very easy for me just to kind of look a, a, a chair or two over and look at, you know, how is Kevin taking notes? How is Kevin studying film? When he's watching film, what is he looking at? When we go on the practice field, what is his mindset? What is his approach? So to be able to work with Kevin those first three years of my career, were really instrumental. And uh, beyond Kevin, that entire Pittsburgh Steelers organization, I honestly can say if I had not broken in the league with those guys, with that organization at that time, I don't think I would have been able to play 15 years because that's where I learned how to be a pro, the physical mindset that it takes, the toughness that it takes, that blue-collar work ethic that I think anybody who comes to the Steelers organization inherits. A uh, very special time to be a Steeler, and very lucky for me I was able to be a part of it because that really informed the rest of my career. And, Ch and Chad, sticking with the Steelers, I want to get your opinion about uh, the the uh, the whole training camp thing with Le'Veon Bell, holdouts and things like that, and then seemingly the team has a little hangover coming into the season. I know it's a business, Chad. You, you know that as good as anyone, but can you ever see a, a situation where holding out is good for a team? I think it may be good for a team from the perspective that it forces you to build up some depth. You know you're getting this other guy back, but while this guy is gone, let's get all these other guys some reps. Let's get them ready to play because at some point, you know, at the running back position, Le'Veon may get nicked up, and you need other guys that you can rely upon. So it really allows you to dial in and get those other guys ready to play and ready to play at a high level because you're going to need that at some point. You know, it's very rare that, you know, a player is able to complete all 16 games in a high manner. So the depth thing is always going to be important. And particularly now with the way offenses, the way the Steelers like to use their backs, even if Le'Veon's not nicked up, because he's such an integral part of their running game and their passing game, they need to get him on the sideline and spell him sometimes. So that's how it can be beneficial to the team. Le'Veon's obviously off to a slow start, but I think he'll, you know, he's got such a tremendous talent that he'll find a way to get things picked up here sooner than later. And, Chad, one of my buddies says he remembers your press conference when you left Pittsburgh and signed with the Seahawks. And he said you jokingly made the statement that you signed there because the sushi, the sushi was so much better in Seattle, which I find hard to imagine when Pittsburgh has the Allegheny and Monongahela Rivers right there. So that could have been it. <laughs> what, what did you uh, decide? The, the Sushi Gate story has obviously lived on uh, and taken a life of its own since 1997, which is when that whole thing happened. Uh, the, the, the origin of that is the Seahawks knew that my agent, my wife, and I were getting hungry, and they said, we'll get you whatever food you want, but we'll only give it to you after you sign the deal. So they ordered from the best sushi restaurant in town and had that sushi delivered. 
and they kept it right outside the conference room they gave my agent and I and my wife to negotiate the contracts. They wouldn't give it to us until they signed the deal. So uh, that's where the whole sushi topic came up. Uh, my wife made a joke, not realizing that it would still be living on, gosh, 20 years later now. Um, you know, Pittsburgh folks certainly – uh, have tremendous pride in their city. Who knew they had such pride in their sushi establishments? Uh, at this point, <laughs> it's more funny than anything. I, I play along with it. You know, Seattle certainly has great sushi. Uh, I think the sushi in Pittsburgh, which I have had over the years, has certainly elevated its game and gotten better. Uh, so, yeah, no no, no more, you know, Pittsburgh, st- Pittsburgh sushi sucks. How about that? It's a fine sushi <laughs> city. <laughs> Uh, Chad, just a couple more before we let you go. And speaking of the Steelers, I need your help feeling better about their defense. It seems like the Bears ran that same stretch play about 42 times last Sunday, and the Steelers couldn't stop it. And stopping the run, you know, is typically a staple of the Steelers' defense, but we've seen them struggle the last couple of years. Jay Ajayi had, a, had 200 yards last year. Isaiah Correll had 152. The Bears just put 220 on them. What's going on? Why can't they stop this play? It's a it's a difficult play to, to stop because there's so many places where the running back can break the play. So he's not really just running to one area. He's being patient with that offensive line. That offensive line is trying to stretch the defense to the sideline, uh, hoping for a gap to open up, and then he can make that cut and get himself downhill. So you need all the players along the front to do their job. And what happens when teams start having success against you is you say, well, I'm going to do something special. I'm going to do something different. You know, my teammate's struggling. Let me help him with his job. So once you start playing outside of your own responsibility, that's when those mistakes kind of happen. And that's why teams are able to run the same play over and over. It's because guys are trying to do things outside of the scope of their job. If everyone does their job, you know, you'll typically be fine. But, again, you're trying to help out this guy, you're guessing the play is going to break outside. When it breaks inside, you start making mistakes, and they start to snowball on you. Uh, you know, I know Keith Butler, the defensive coordinator. I know he does a fantastic job. You know, uh, I know they're excited about uh, T.J. Watt and his ability to get after the quarterback. But to really stop that play effectively, you need two good outside linebackers who can set the edge, not allow that thing to get stretched to the sideline. You need a nose guard who doesn't get pushed back, who allows those – inside linebackers to flow downhill. You have those two components, it really gives you a chance to stop that play. Right now, they're not getting really high-level play outside of those two components on those plays. Chad, one more. Um, the Steelers are 5-13 and 13 on the road against teams that are under 500 during Mike Tomlin's era, and we see it over and over again year after year. They sort of play down to the level – of their competition. I mean, Mike Lennon, 6-15 and 15 as a starting quarterback. Two of those six wins have come against the Steelers. So, you know, is, is there something to that? Is it a mindset? You know, help me understand what, what, what goes on that, the, you know, they continue to struggle against teams that uh, are so far under 500. You know, the Mike Tomlin saying, I think we've all heard him say it, if you follow Mike Tomlin long enough and the Steelers long enough, the standard is the standard. Uh, which should be the case and should be easy for teams and guys to understand. But it is inevitable in NFL football when it, it's such a high-pressure atmosphere, you can't help but, but look to take a break someplace somewhere along the way. And you, you know, you finish one game and you look at next week's opponent and you go, oh, they're not so good. They got a losing record, you know. And then to your point, you play down to their level of play. You don't play to your standard. You play to their standard, and you let them hang around. You give them life. The difference in talent in the NFL is so thin that if you let any team hang around long enough, they can find a way to beat you. And you would hope that the Steelers would learn this lesson. But as you point out, the the record's pretty significant, and it's been going on for years now. Uh, Mike Tomlin has got to find a way maybe to change up the routine to get these guys to understand that the standard is the standard. It doesn't dip – when we play somebody who's not so good and then rise when we play somebody who is good, we play to our level all the time. Uh, somehow that message is not being communicated and not being understood. Chad, before we let you go, you're broadcasting now. Tell our listeners how they can you know, listen to you and find you, uh, whether it's online, on TV, or on social media. 
Well, you can find me on Twitter at Chad Brown 94. Uh, I'm always, you know, taking pictures of games before I broadcast them and, you know, obviously some insights into my life. And a lot of times uh, the majority discussion is clearly going to be football. Uh, this week I've got Ole Miss uh, visiting Alabama for, for Compass Media. You can go to compassmedia.com and find a local station, which will be airing that game. Next week, I have got uh, Oregon State and USC for the Pac-12 Network. So between Compass Media and Pac-12 Network, that's where I'll be broadcasting for the remainder of the season. And then I heard your previous guest, Vern, uh, has summited some pretty incredible mountains. I had the great experience uh, this March to climb Mount Kilimanjaro with really? Chris Long, Howie Long. Yes, uh, Howie Long's son, Chris Long, uh, went up with UCLA head coach Jim Mora. Uh, Nate Boyer, the former Green Beret who had uh, some time with the Seattle Seahawks. So a very cool trip, raised lots of money for clean water and wells in Africa, uh, and a really you know life-changing experience more than just climbing the mountain, but uh, to see the ability of just something we take advantage of over here, turn on a faucet and water coming out, the ability to provide water to these villages and to these schools uh, really was a life-changing experience for me and for the folks who got the water, very happy I, I did that. Uh, and if folks are interested in supporting that, they can go to uh, cleanwater.org and give money and donate to the the, uh, the wells for uh, providing clean water in Africa. Wow. Can, you know, kudos to you guys for doing that. What a wonderful thing and what amazing adventure. So hopefully the next time we have you on the show, we'll talk a little bit more about what that must have been like. But uh, we can't thank you enough for taking time out of your night, Chad, to come back on the show. It's always a privilege for Bob and I to get to spend some time with you. So thank you for uh, for being a part of the show as often as you have. Thank you, uh, it's always uh, fun being on with you guys. I always appreciate it. And you guys have a good one. Take it easy. All right. Take care, Chad. All the best to you and your family. All right. See ya. That is uh, former Pro Bowl linebacker Chad Brown. Climb Mount Kilimanjaro. So we get two mountain climbing stories tonight, Bob. Amazing stuff. Yeah, and uh, two guys that, uh, man, there, there's two spotlights on the positive already there, Chris. But, yeah, right? Chad, we love him. Had a great career. And uh, is, is not just a good journalist, Chris. Is a, he's just a spectacular commentator. And, uh, again, uh, wherever he's working, I urge people to tune in because uh, he, he's, his insight is incredible. So, uh, again, every time we learn a lot when we talk to Chad, great guest. Yeah, he is. His talents are endless, and what a great player he was, and he does a fantastic job as a broadcaster as well. So we look forward to catching up with Chad again real soon.